All right. So if we're ready, I know Lexi is uh, still emailing out that third memo, and I do have copies of no, each of the. Done. Oh, we're done. Yes. Yeah, you guys all have to. Do. Uh, um, I have copies of them here in case anybody wants a hard copy of anything while we're working our way through. It mostly pertains to David's work, so um, if you need it. So <clears throat> really briefly, to go back into the sea level rise mapping uh, that we have done based on the TNC uh, modeling uh, that was done, uh, finished up about a year ago now. Um, what the mapping includes, and if you have the website up, you can see all of the maps in the room. We have the combined hazard maps up against the wall. Um, it includes three planning horizons, or four if you count existing. It includes the existing conditions, 2030, 2060, and 2100, with three different levels of CLRI for the 2030, 2060, and 2100. Obviously, existing is existing. Um, and then it maps coastal hazards in combination with sea level rise of various different types. And those types are monthly high tide inundation, so monthly high tide, which occurs now, combined with sea level rise, beach and dune erosion, combined with sea level rise, coastal storm wave, coastal storm flood, all combined with sea level rise, and then the perfect storm, all of those hazards occurring at the same time with sea level rise. So I, I don't know the odds of that occurring, but if it did, we have that mapping and that modeling done. Um, if you look at the maps, and as Chris said and as I said before, there are four planning areas. Planning Area 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are McGrath, Mandalay, and Chris described those. Um, Oxnard Shores, which is primarily residential. Channel Islands Harbor, which is the area around the harbor um, at, in the various different jurisdictions. And then Ormond Beach, which is the area south of the city of Port Miami, includes the wetland area, Health Coast site. Ormond Beach Power Plant and the city's uh, wastewater treatment plant and the AW, the Advanced Water Purification Facility. Um, for all of those sea level rise scenarios, or for all of the planning horizons, there are three, three different sea level rise scenarios. So There's the low scenario, uh, which you know gets larger and larger as the planning horizons move forward, the moderate scenario, and the high scenario. Um, when you look at the maps, there's a variety of colors on them. What we tried to show graphically, and I, I hope it's clear, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we could make it clear. Um, you look at your hazard map, you look at your planning horizon, and then the three colors within those are the low, medium, and high scenario for sea level rise for that hazard in that time frame. So if in the room, hopefully it's clear, you can see the, the light color would be the low uh, scenario, the medium color is the medium color, so it would be everything in the medium plus all of the low, and then the high is the dark color, which would be all the dark, all the medium, and all the low. So um, you just as you, as you combine them up, it shows you your inundation, in this case, in the room for the combined hazards, but we have them broken out for even different hazards. And so there's the existing conditions so to show kind of how it marches through over the time horizon. We've got them all on one map so you can work your way through the planning area over time. So existing 2030, 2060, 2100, and then low, medium, high, low, medium, high, low, medium, high. So hopefully that's clear. Um, we are still open to suggestions. If it's not, uh, the public has seen these, and we haven't gotten a lot of confusion, but I'm not sure how confident they would be to say something anyway. But if you if you have an alternate idea for the way this can be presented in a more readable fashion, we're absolutely open to that. Um, <clears throat> I think I just went through this. We've got you know areas one to four. We've got the kind of Port Wyneme, County Beach area. Um, we've got the, we have five map pages for each planning area. 
So this, for example, this is planning area two. We've got the individual hazards maps in exactly the same format, and then the combined hazards maps at the end. So there's 20 maps, 20 maps uh, for each, or 25 maps planning area. Um, okay. So what this is, <coughs> what's on the screen is what's on the wall as well. This is the combined hazard zone for planning area one, which is McGrath Mandalay. Um, as I said, I'm not going to go into them in huge detail, but if you have a question about a specific planning area or you want to know something, we can certainly talk about it. But as you can see, um, I'm going to move over here. So this is the existing condition. So this is all hazards, you know, at high tide right now, existing conditions 2010. This is the type of flooding that the model predicts will occur. So with if the let me go back. Uh, not including tsunamis. Not including tsunamis, right. And that would be really bad. Point out this is the San Clara River flood as well. Right. So when I say combined hazards, it's monthly high tide beach with beach dune erosion, with a coastal storm wave, with a coastal storm flood all occurring at the same time. And in our atlas, which we're finalizing, we have uh, definitions of what each of these are, you know, kind of what they mean. Um, we have a we have icons for them to help it, you know, be as graphically interpretable as possible. Um, so what we're seeing on the left there is that we're in a serious world of hurt without any sea level rise. Right. If all of this occurs together with a San Clara River flood, so. Um, as we move forward, that San Clara River flood isn't part of the equation, and so it isn't quite as extreme. But um, when you move to the next one, the 2030, in order to be able to see what the existing conditions are, that is the um, hatched line, so you can kind of see as it moves forward. Um, there is some increase in the, in the inundation under the low scenario, and a, a slight under the moderate, and not. This so, so the way to look at those mm -hmm. other three to the right are the blue zones are flooding that does not exist today? The, the light blue is the low scenario. So in this case, the low scenario and existing don't, there's not much difference because they're covered by the hatch. The, right, this is the flooding oh, that this would... Is all, this, this, oh, okay, so all of these are reflect worst case scenario. In the future. And so the blue is additional flooding right. relative right. to existing to sea level rise. Got got rise. In so combination with sea level rise. Is this with a competent Santa Clara River levy or without? That I do not know. Okay. That would it's be well, without. Would there, yeah. But uh, maybe um, Robert, you correct me if I'm wrong. Scenario, the way Dave Ravel explained it to me. But you have a major coastal storm that's lasting for days and days, and we're getting lots and lots of rain. In an El Nino season, when the ground is already saturated from a bunch of previous storms, the river's running pretty high. The river's coming down and meets high tide, and it literally can't push itself out into the ocean, or it's not all of it. And the only place to go is up, and it tops the levee on both sides. And that's why you get this flood out over the farmland. Because the river is just piling up at the mouth of the river. Right, and and <coughs> you're getting a storm wave over top of okay. it. Okay, right. So, well. right. so it's a real worst case. Scenario. It's a real worst case. But it happened in what, 82, 83, something like this? Uh, this is based on the 82, 83 uh, storm event. Mm -hmm. We didn't know this. Thank you. Chris, do you want to add anything? No, thank you. Thank you for your okay. So, so as you're reading them, it's a good question about how to read them. And what you see really is that it isn't until the future, the, the far future scenario, that you really start to see 
a substantial increase, at least in this zone, of flooding. And when by this zone, I mean the area closer to the coast, the farmland is it does mm -hmm. increase. But that and that the it's really the the high scenario that is going if that occurs, it's going to push the flooding out. So it's I guess but also to keep in back your mind, it's very far in the future, and the high scenario would have to occur in order to get this level of flooding. So, um, and as you move out, the, the modeling becomes more prediction and less projection. Is that the coastal zone boundary line? The I yellow. Know. Okay. This is the LCP area. planning area. So this is plan the the yellow line is planning shows planning area one. As we move down, you have the, the top of planning area two shown in that frame. And as we move down, you we'll move through those. And then the, the hatched line is the city boundary. So there's a lot of county, you know, kind of shown in some of these areas. But um, is that 101 with, with the curved yellow line on the right side? No. no. no that's the, this is the LCP boundary. There's the river. Harbor Boulevard is in here. Maybe point out where Victoria Avenue is. That should be the right edge of the LCP. Yeah, it's area. like. Where is it? Or it no. on the next yeah, I think one. it's on here. Um, Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Oops. Okay, so <clears throat> this we're kind of out of. There we go. Hmm. All right, so we'll fix this. Maybe we'll jump ahead to David's stuff. I I thought we had all the maps in here. No, we don't. All right. So what we can do is if anybody wants to talk about any of the other areas, we certainly can. Um, what we've also done, we've updated our ESHA mapping. Um, we can, I'm not a biologist, I'll admit, but I'm happy to talk about that in a very general sense. What we've done is used, um, we've updated the ESHA based on a bunch of new information. Obviously, the ESHA mapping in the LCP is based on very old information because of when it was done. So the bulk of our effort has been to gather um, as much information from existing studies for the area as possible in order to update that information. And then we've gone, you know, we've gone out to CNDDB. We've gathered information from various other studies that have been done in the area. Um, we've uh, found information on existing native habitat and vegetation communities, and then we're gathering at the moment more marine resource information. We were light on that, so we're trying to get more uh, to update our ESHA. Um, we are now refining what we've done um, because of the amount of information available. There are some areas that we're having to check in or check out whether or not they belong in the ESHA, and we're being guided a bit by what was done um, down in Malibu by the Santa Monica uh, Mountains Conservancy to draw the line between ESHA and non-ESHA, and I, I wish I could explain a little bit more about how we're doing that, but um, our lead biologist is handling that. So if you have questions on ESHA in particular, um, I'm happy to take those and, and we can get her in touch with you, and I know she's been in touch with the commission staff. And work our way through that process. Uh, Jennifer, just the other maps are on the flash drive. Oh, they are? So okay. If you want to pull them all up, right. you can pull them up. And while you're doing that, the, the ESHA, the Environmentally Sensitive Habitat, we don't really expect to find, you know, significant new areas of that. Okay, I didn't know that. Cities. It's really updating the existing ones we know about, the dunes, the beaches, and certainly one on beach with just more recent data. Because there's stuff in the LCP with hand-drawn in 1983. Yeah. Useful yeah. Uh, sources of information may be the area contingency plan for oil spills because every foot of the coast has been mapped and sensitive species have been identified and strategies have been identified to protect those sensitive species in the case of an oil spill on the coast. Great. So that would be useful in area one with our wells, even though the wells are in the county, the rate nested within our coastal zone. 
There's no well down in Norman Beach. It doesn't matter if there are wells. Oh, really? Down. Okay. This is this is oil spill response. Uh -huh. And where is that? Is that available online? Those aren't the California bond. It'll have all of them in it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. See, monthly tidal inundation hazard. This isn't the. Combined. That's okay. Combined. Yeah. Oh, no, but it'll clip down. It goes through all of them. Did you want to see combined? They're in there. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. So that's the end of the free. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So sorry about that. I obviously. All right. So to, can everybody online see these maps? I think so. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, to go back up to planning area one, um, we have again. I showed you the combined hazard map. When, if you want to look very specifically about the different types of hazards, they are all broken out. This is the um, monthly tidal inundation hazard for McGrath Mandalay. What is obvious when you look at them is that it's when they're all combined that the wide array of flooding occurs. So it's actually, I think, myself, very useful to look at the individual maps to get a sense of when the individual hazards occur, what the extent of the flooding is going to be because the odds of all of them combining together, while not out of the realm of possibility, are obviously, you know, they become lower. Um, <clears throat> so this is the map for um, monthly tidal inundation for uh, Planning Area 1. As you can see, there's not a, you can really look at it, the sea level rise doesn't seem to affect this particular coastal hazard that much in this area. Um, when you look at the background erosion hazards, again, this area here, Compared to existing conditions, there isn't a vast increase. Uh, you start to see a little bit more excess at the top of planning area two for the erosion. You do start to see um, sea level rise combined with coastal storm wave hazard zones. You start to see some additional flooding as a result of the various sea level rise scenarios, especially as you move into 2060 and 2100. And then the, um, similar for the coastal storm flood hazard zones. And you know, when you think about the types of things that come together, you, you could very easily have a coastal storm flood and a coastal storm wave hazard occur together given the, the current types of meteorologic conditions. So <clears throat> when looking at those two, you can see why when you combine the coastal, you use a combined hazard set, you know, you get this larger increase. Good question. question. Um, what, kind, what storm are you using as your baseline? For this? Are you using the storm? Here? It's the 82-83. Um, one of the questions that we have going forward is which scenario, to what extent do we plan and make new things as, as what amount of effort for each of the scenarios? So mm -hmm. obviously existing conditions right now, 15 years from now we get to 2030, should we put that into a capital improvement program, for example? You know, and then 30, 30 years beyond that, do we just kind of watch and wait and see, or do we do we plan for just wave run up and not worry about arc store? You know, what combinations of things do we uh, essentially try to react to? Uh, and because there's so much, or do we go all the way to the worst case, highest level, worst case, and, and do that? And for a wastewater treatment plant, that might make sense. But for something else, you may not need to do that. I, I don't know. Right. When you think about for example, the amount of time it takes to design, do the environmental design, procure, build a major piece of infrastructure like a wastewater treatment plan or like the AWPS. You want a little bit longer planning horizon when you're thinking about where you're going to put it because it could take you, or a desal plant or something like that. It could take you 15 years to get something like that through all the various permitting steps and through the processes. And if you're designing it, placing it with this in mind, but then 2030, is the time when it actually comes online and you're, you've placed it somewhere where in only 30 years it's going to be potentially inundated, you, know, you need to take that into account. So um, like Chris said, I think what, what we're going to be doing in our policy analysis and some of our vulnerability analyses is weighing up what are we talking about, what are the risks, what are the vulnerabilities, how far in advance do we need to plan and do we, do we engineer for 2100 or do we plan for 2100, do we, and we engineer for 2060, or, you know, taking into account those issues is the question. I just have a question. Is
Is this specifically just for environmental purposes, or do you guys identify where any of maybe the county's critical facilities are located and may be impacted? Well, that's, that's actually why, why you're here. <laughs> um, we have, uh, we've reached out to the city of Oxnard for where their facilities, critical facilities are, but as part of this process, we want to solicit your input as we start to work through our policy work and our, our planning vulnerability assessments to find out if there's any other facilities that we need to be taking into account as we start to draft our policies, draft our short-term, medium-term, long-term planning. Yeah, I, you know, you have these various threats. Are you trying to quantify probabilities or recurrence intervals and that sort of thing so that you It's That's outside the scope of, of this yeah. particular work, yeah. Add, add to that, the, um, the, with sea level rise, sea level rise is still considered to be projections. So that's, and that is a complicating factor is that for engineering, you typically, in the past, we've always looked at historical records and developed statistics to figure out potential probabilities, right? And that's what we designed for. That's what insurance rates are based on. The problem, if you will, with sea level rise is nobody knows what the probability is. So everything is now scenario-based projections. There's talk about trying to put percentages to that, but they haven't done it yet. So the Army Corps, FEMA, that's one of the reasons why, a big reason why they're not saying it's going to be insurance rate yet. They're, they're not incorporating it into a probabilistic method it's because they haven't figured that out yet. So we're, but, but, but we'll, you have serious problems without any sea level rise, mm -hmm. potentially. It's yeah. like, you know, you, you can't really hide behind the, the uh, uncertainty of the sea level rise and say, oh, we can't consider probability. So I don't think it's, we're not hiding behind it. You know, that's why the Coastal Commission and their, their policy guidance is you have to consider it. They want you to consider the full range, low to high, at each of the time horizons that you're looking at over the life of your project. And so consider it means what are your vulnerabilities and then develop your adaptation measures. So that's what we're doing here. That's another reason why we look at each, breaking it down by component. As Jennifer said, the, the big thing is to combine, but we don't really know what the probability is of those things occurring, but we don't want to use that as an excuse not to do any planning for those. So we are looking at them, and right, they have different time horizons. So, for example, this one, oh wait, is this the first one? Can you go back to one? The high tide. So if you just look at high tide, if you're saying, well, this is the monthly tidal inundation in the future with sea level rise. Well, obviously there, that would suggest adaptation measure if you are, say you have a building, and right now you're fine, but in 2060, your yard is going to be flooded on a monthly basis by tide. Not a big damage. You're not going to be getting hit with waves or storms or anything, but your yard is going to be flooded with six inches of water. That suggests one adaptation measure, whereas if you're fine up until, say, here when you've got coastal storm that might have a 50, 25, probably a 50 to 75 year recurrence interval for a wave event combined with high ocean water, and then you're going to get flooded during that storm, that could suggest a adaptation measure that's short term. In other words, part of it could be raising the elevation. Part of your adaptation may be you have a management structure in place to deal with that, either deploying sandbags or some kind of measures that are temporary to help you during a storm, but then those measures can be removed during the majority of time in which you know, fair weather and your property, your, your infrastructure is okay. So, it's complicated because we've got multiple threats in terms of magnitude, in terms of how the duration at which those events occur, and the potential impact. And on the flip side, the infrastructure that's being impacted is also variable. Again, if it's critical infrastructure, that suggests one level of protection, where if it's, say, a park or a golf course, maybe just let it get flooded and come back to the event, fine. So those are the things we have to grapple with as we get through this into that Vulnerability assessment. Vulnerability assessment, yeah. In the various planning areas. Is it possible to develop joint probability distributions? I mean, you, we have a lot of, uh, of wave data, uh, you know, that's been accumulated over the past 30 years or so. So we can for water levels and we can for wave data based on the historical record. Um, then we have, like, Scripps has been doing work where they've been projecting water levels into the future, developing a you know, probability density function for the future, doing the same thing for waves. But again, there are projections. You could say, well, look, what's the probability? They say, well, 
the, the major issue with sea level rise is so much of it is dependent on what we as humans do. So that's the big thing. The scenarios are all based on how humans respond to climate change. You know, at one end is, at the high end, we do nothing. We continue life the way we're going, and so we're putting carbon in the air the way we are. China, everyone's developing at the same rate. That drives huge sea level rise and huge carbon, huge changes. At the other end is, we cut everything off in the next five or ten years, and we basically go back to 1993 levels. Even that still has a projection because there's a, a lag, right? All the carbon we put in the air now and we'll continue to put in, even if we cut back down, is still going to have a big impact. So nobody knows, you know, since we haven't historically seen it yet, how do you do a probability density function on something that hasn't occurred yet? They yeah, I guess we're worried about what we have today, um, let alone sea level rise. It seems like we have a pretty significant potential threat, and I'm not yeah. sure that the planners have really come to grips with that. I agree. And as a matter of fact, when I talk about the storm drain thing, I'll tell you now that one of the punchlines for me is we did that as vulnerability assessment, expecting to have a range of results from not vulnerable, somewhat vulnerable, and highly vulnerable. And what we found was under existing conditions, we only found one storm drain that was marginally vulnerable. All the others were vulnerable right now. Right. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's right. Yeah. And that's right. that's kind of what we're working towards with our, our vulnerability assessments and our policy um, work that we're going to be doing to for existing conditions uh, to adapt even to just the risks now. And then as we move through the planning horizons, taking into account the infrastructure or the development that's in the areas, what what planning can be done, what policy can be done, and then what what can we think about doing in the future or start to adapt to for the future scenarios. Um, what I will say is that all of this is information. I, you know, I think anybody's saying this is absolutely what is going to occur in 85 years from now, but it's all information is always good. It's always you know, it's good to have on the table what, what the current science says and that as we move through time and as the science improves and as more information comes forward, then additional adaptation is going to have to occur. And by adaptation, I mean in the plan. Um, bearing in mind the time we're at, is there, we've just looked at planning area one. Is there anybody with, that would like to look at any other planning areas specifically? Um, I it's a good segue to go to page one. Well, that's what I was yeah. thinking. Um, are these available online? These are all online. Uh, you can have a look at them okay. at your leisure. If you have any questions, uh, feel free. If you are interested in the very specific modeling that was done or the, um, the assumptions that were included, those were all done by TNC and it's part of a, if you go to the Coastal Resilience Centura website, that information is available if you want to dive into the, the detail. Um, okay, so there's no other questions on the sea level rise mapping. Um, you're always welcome to, obviously, after you've looked at them, if you have additional questions and you want to come back and email us and we can, we're happy to talk on the phone about any of the results. Um, we'll move on to David's presentation. Which one is that? That one. Mm -hmm. I think it's that one. David, this is the clicker if you want it. Okay. So thank you. So uh, we have till what time? Two. Uh, three. Yeah. Until three. Okay. What time is it right now? Two thirty. Two thirty. Yeah. Okay. All right, so thank you. So we've got, uh, we were tasked for doing, for doing three things. One is the tsunami. So Jennifer went through all the other elements and the question mm -hmm. to them was, well, what impact will sea level rise have on increasing the vulnerability due to tsunamis? So it's a good question. So we were tasked with looking into that. The state of California in 2009 put together a hazard mapping for tsunamis. And so we started with that for our existing risk, if you will, the existing hazards. Um, but the methodology that they used, I'm going to really simplify here, but basically they looked at all kinds of sources for tsunamis, um, underwater landslides, seismic events, you know, uh, faults moving. And they then had a model that propagated those waves across the ocean all the way up to the Aleutians in Alaska um, down to the coast. And so they, that was what they did. This was a very coarse map, if you will, coarse model, because it was propagating across the ocean. Brought these to the shore, and they came up with 
estimates for the mapping based on the elevation of the water and the ground elevation in that area. And that's how they did their 2009 mapping. I'm simplifying, but basically that, that's what they did. We were very site specific here, so we needed to come up with a method that was both um, a little bit more detailed so that we could get at this level and also consistent with the method of all the work that TNC did that Revel worked with, as you've seen here. So we adopted a similar type of approach, and I'm going to, what that is, is basically called a bathtub type model. Um, how many people have heard that mentioned before? Bathtub? Yeah. So basically, we're estimating the water level at the ocean interface, comparing that to elevations on the land side, and if the elevation of the water is greater than the ground elevation, then flooding can occur. Now what we do though is we've noted that um, this, if you have an area that the ground is lower than your water level, but in between you have high land, that wouldn't get affected. But if you have a hydraulic connection, meaning say a dune gets wiped out or a, a pipeline, a storm drain gets flooded, those provide connections that will allow that water to get in and, and result in that flooding. Okay? So that's kind of a background. Other thing we looked at was the storm drain. We looked at um, the vulnerability of the storm drains to sea level rise. Okay. So first, the tsunami analysis. Okay, so the approach we took was we selected tide data, we used mean higher high water, so we assumed that the tsunami occurred at mean higher high the, the tide level was at mean higher high water when the tsunami occurred. Okay? We had two tide stations um, and basically we took an average of those. Um, we selected the future sea level rise conditions to match this work here, the 2030, 2060, 2100 values. Um, that's important for coastal because Jennifer's little slide earlier pointed out that it did not go to the maximum 65 inches at 2100. It went to 58 inches, I believe. Um, and there are reasons for, the back, for that back in the uh, Nature Conservancy study, so all that's been documented. But it captures most of the range. Okay, we selected tsunami. We looked at two types of tsunamis, basically. We looked at historical tsunamis for which we had measured water level data which was fortunate because we had the Japanese tsunami in 2011, we weren't fortunate, but especially the Japanese, but we had measured data for how the water levels responded here along our coast during that tsunami. And then we had the local tsunami, the Goleta 2 landslide, and this one was identified as generating, potentially generating the largest tsunami. Um, I say potential because it's identified as a potential source of a tsunami we don't have measured data on actually what would happen if that occurred. So if this, this is all analysis and projections of what could occur. So we looked at those. We estimated maximum water levels for the years 2015, 2030, 2060, and 2100. Um, and we mapped it as the potential tsunami inundation. So that's, I say potential again, because this is based on the method we developed and the assumption that hydraulic, hydraulic connections will occur that you would get that kind of inundation. Yes? David, uh, on the tsunami events, um, uh, how are those defined? Is it the, the peak elevation of the tsunami wave, or is it, is it shoaled into the coast? Um, so that's a good question, because uh, one of the details, in some of the mapping and analyses that was done by the state, and some of the sources that we found, sometimes they referred to the tsunami height. Sometimes they referred to the tsunami amplitude. And sometimes they refer to the tsunami elevation. Um, from an engineer and the coastal processes standpoint, those are can be different things. You know, that basically the height. This is a wave. If you have a wave like this, the height is the distance from crest to trough. The amplitude is half that distance. The water elevation matters. If, if you're at high tide, in the top of the wave, this would be the water elevation. If you're at low tide, it would be down here. <coughs> so what we had to do was. Based on the source that we had, Jim, we had to um, extract what they were saying. In some cases, it didn't make sense that it was height. They must have met water elevation. So we ultimately backed that out to come up with, to be consistent, we came up with water elevation relative to a fixed datum in ABD 88. So that's what we ultimately did. But it took some teasing out to get to that. Um, we, uh, we looked at the uh, NOAA bathymetric data, GIS, and storm drains, um, and delineated the area below maximum water levels in GIS to do the mapping that had a similar look to what was done um, for the work that Jennifer talked about. So the tsunamis we got, we had the um, Chilean, the 2010 Chilean tsunami, uh, both at Santa Barbara, pardon me, Santa Monica and Santa Barbara. So 
we were able to get the water level data that was measured, subtract out the predicted tide, and the difference was is the red here, and this is the tsunami. So you can see the difference initially is pretty small, and then you see, boom, that big where the red really starts on 28th of February, that's the tsunami. And of course, what you notice is if you track it, you see all the way through uh, March 2nd, March 3rd, that tsunami is still propagating and bouncing back and forth across the ocean. So that's what you're basically seeing there. So we got this for the two stations, and then we had the same thing for Jap the Japanese tsunami. And we ended up selecting the one that was the larger. So in this case, we went with the <coughs> Japanese tsunami. It was the one we selected. You can see here, then we have the next slide here. We've got the flood elevations and the elevation associated with the Japanese tsunami in the year 2015 will be 7.7, estimated in 2030, 2060, and 2100 with sea level rise, going from 8.3 to 12 and a half feet in 2100. For the Goleta 2 landslide tsunami, in 2015, it's estimated it would be about 14 and a half feet, this could hit now, all the way up to 19 and a half feet in the year 2100 with sea level rise, uh, the projections of sea level rise. Are there any plans to go with the current Cal-OES, Cal-CGS. So um, there are plans to, the, the state right now is in the process of revisiting their 20, 2009 hazard map, the um, tsunami hazard map. And there's one, there was a, a recent, uh, last year, they found a, another fault off the coast. Um, you, some of you may have seen it in the paper. Um, and they've actually done a tsunami modeling with that and projected that it could be as high as 20 feet. Um, it says 20 feet height, so that's another one of these ones we're trying to find out. What it's still, it's still not our worst case scenario as developed by either the Geological Society or Cal OES. <coughs> that model that they're using is still not the best model that we have to work with. Okay. The one that we looked at, they did look at the Aleutians and the last year, so I know that they've got those as sources, but if there's another one that's larger, from the work we've seen and all the, what they call the far field sources like Alaska, the Goleta 2 was still the largest one at the time. But this more, the more recent closer one in Ventura is supposed to be, would be bigger than the Goleta 2. The State Geologic Survey who prepared that hazard map uh, in 2009 for the state is looking at that Ventura one to see if they're going to update their maps and include that one in there. So if you are someone at the, um, the state, Rick Wilson and yeah, we could get a, some contact information. That'd be, that'd be great. Thank you. So anyway, so that's basically what we did. And then we used the same kind of structures you saw on these maps over here by planning area. We mapped it out from, again, existing condition in 2015, then with sea level rise 2030, 2060, 2100, by planning area to show, and you see the way we map it is potential inundation area below 7.7 .7 feet and ABD, okay? So um, you can see here the light blue is the potential is just below that. Um, and then we brag this shows potential inundation area below 14.6 feet. So the light blue in this case represents that Japanese tsunami. The dark, the dark blue here represents what would be inundated in 2015 with the Goleta 2 landslide um, tsunami. Okay. And then we map that out to 2100, and we do that for all five, well, four plan areas plus the uh, Fort Wanini area. Okay, so we laid that all out. Um, questions on that? Anyway, and on the phone too, do you have any questions on, on that? Okay, so this is the one Jennifer was mentioning. I, I don't think this one out earlier, but I think this, did this go out at the uh, break? Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, so this is a memo that's in the break. Now, one other thing that we did here is we developed a hydrodynamic model for Channel Islands Harbor. And the reason for this is, remember the idea as well, that the tsunami just propagates across, and I said the way we did it was we used this bathtub model and it assumes that these hydraulic connections are formed through the beach or something. Well, so what if, what if we have the tsunami just propagate around, over or around the breakwater into Channel Islands Harbor? How far can that go back, okay? 
So we did a hydrogen model to look at that. Okay. This, so then what we did here was to look at the effect of the tsunami as it propagates under existing conditions and with sea level rise in the future. And we also, as long as we had the model set up, engineers, we like to run models. Let's also look at how um, if we had a, high, a really high tide, say a kink tide in the future with sea level rise, what kind of inundation would we get? I try to use the, the terminology of inundation to mean longer term. So tides sea level rise, and anomalies associated with El Nino, the inundation. Flooding, tsunami, or coastal storms like waves, they're shorter term duration. But in either case, we're talking about you know, high water level. Okay. So the approach then was we selected the tide condition. We used for analyzing the tsunami. We had a mean tide that varied from mean higher high to mean lower low to mean lower high water and then to mean higher low water and repeat. Okay, so that's the tide we used. When we were looking at the extreme ocean water level condition, the tide we looked at then was a king tide plus the El Nino. And what we chose here was when we started this, this was one was not our plan, when we bit, you know, when we put the project together. But what we decided was we ended up going with the in two thousand in uh, November twenty fifteen because we knew it would be fresh on everyone's mind. We had the sea level uh, El Nino sea level anomaly, the SLA there that was already occurring. So, and we had measured data. So we said, let's just use that one. So we selected the future sea level rise conditions, again, 2030 to 2100 that Jennifer presented, the tsunami event. We selected a hydrodynamic model called TUFLOW, capital letters, TU flow. Um, and then we conducted the modeling to estimate the extent of the tsunami-induced flooding and to estimate the extent of extreme ocean water level inundation. Okay. So here are just the tide data again that we use for both Santa Barbara and Santa Monica. Like I said, we, we average those to come up with that tide series. And here's the tidal series. So again, going from mean lower low, or pardon me, mean higher high to mean lower low to mean lower high to mean higher low, and repeat. We used again the 2011 Japanese tsunami, mentioned earlier. Okay, and so we took those and combined them to come up with this water level time series at the ocean boundary. And this was what was used to drive the model. Okay, so it starts off at time zero, and you see the different water levels. The green at the bottom is existing condition. That's 2015 sea level, mean sea level, and then the red is 2030. The blue is 2060, and the purple is 2100. Okay, and no tsunami initially. We run the model, and you see at time just after time 30, about hour 30, is when the tsunami hits under each of those different scenarios. So for each one of these lines, for each one of these curves, that's a, a, a separate model one that we did. Okay, so the water level is recorded at uh, NOAA's Santa Monica station on November 24th, 25th, as I mentioned. These are the, the water levels that we used. Um, which were pretty high. Um, I'm not sure exactly here, but I know at some of the ones down in San Diego and LA, they, we actually set records with high, high water levels now. Okay, so the water time series at the model ocean boundary for this extreme, here's that. So again, now we've taken those same, the same tide I mentioned earlier, but now with the, no, pardon me, with the November 24th, 25th tide, and with 2015 sea level through 2100 sea level. And this is what we use to run and analyze the extreme water level um, inundation. Okay, this is the setup of the two flow model. So this is that we got bathymetry and topography for the area. And so out to, you know, the model ocean boundary is out there where it's labeled model ocean boundary. Along the edge here, you can see the breakwater um, here, the jetties uh, for the entrance channel, and ranging from minus 20 elevation, and then all the way up to plus 30, where we have the high ground. So this is how we resolve the area all the way back to the Edison Channel. Okay, um, basically, if you consider this entire water body to be a hydrologic connection for high tides, sea level rise, and tsunamis. Okay, so this is a, after we run the model, we have results here and just simplify here for two locations. We have the boundary condition, BC, which is the point just offshore of the breakwater, okay? And then all the way back to the Edison Canal to see how far back it goes um, is point A in red. And the results are shown on the right in 
2015 at the top down to 2100 at the bottom. And you can see the blue, the blue trace in the graph is the uh, boundary condition, and the uh, red is point A in the back. And what you can see when you look here is the basically the water level response during tsunamis in the back area in the Edison Canal matches pretty much the boundary condition. So in other words, there's very little muting of the water level as the tsunami moves in. There is a lag. You can see what we call a phase lag. You can see that the blue is occurring here. Say so the peak occurs at about hour 42. Um, for those on the phone, I'm using the example of the year 2060. If you look at hour 42 on blue, you'll see that it peaks right at hour 42, and it's maybe another hour or so after, or maybe not even, the scale half hour to an hour, say, that the red peaks back there. So that's just saying it takes a while, a little while for the tsunami to propagate all the way through the channel back there. Did you run that bidirectionally, or did you only run it from the channel entrance back to point A? Um, well, the model the model can do both in and out. So, so it's a hydrodynamic model that allows no, no, tide coming in. Coming in through the Edison Canal. Oh, you mean if the tsunami comes in this way? Yeah, no, we did not consider that. So thank you. That's a good point. Is that so? This method does not at all consider what I presented earlier of the method of assuming a hydraulic connection from the ocean interface this way. This method and the results I'm going to show you only allow for the tsunami and sea level rise and high tides to come in through the entrance this way. David, are you surprised that there's not a significant attenuation? Um, I was at first, um, but you know, when we looked, first we started with the tides. So you know, the, the duration of the tides is about, the tide has like a six hours period, right? So you got six hours. So we were seeing, we, we looked at Channel Island Harbor years ago. We had a project in 2003, I think it was, and we weren't seeing much um, beauty then. So this one had a period of about 20 minutes. So um, we thought, yeah, it was a little suspicious. But we, we went back and we were looking at some records from some of the uh, other harbors and stuff, and they were seeing a similar thing. They were seeing that uh, there was a phase by, but not much muting. So it could, now it could be also because this is, as tsunamis go, this is relatively small. It's a, it's a pretty small tsunami. It's on the order, I think it was like a foot and a half to two feet in height. So it's a pretty small tsunami. Um, and some of the harbors, I, I think it was the Japanese one that was larger, it occurred close to, I think that's the one that occurred close to low tide. So the good news was it didn't really have any effect on high water levels. But there was some damage in some harbors and stuff for boats being moored because it occurred, it wasn't quite at low tide, it was just it was going down, and so you already had high ebb tide coming out, and this just, when it, so coming in wasn't the problem. When the, the tsunami was on the drain, when it was ebbing along with the tides, there were some really high velocities, and so they had some problems there. I don't know specifically if they had problems at Channel Islands Harbor. Yep. Uh, so if I look through each of those, the, the blue being the baseline, uh, are you, uh, are you seeing, you know, two foot elevation in 2030, you know, roughly, roughly to be roughly in 2060. Is that, is that the, uh, the assumption of king tide? No. The king tide, I mean, king tide elevation, then you've been applied to tsunami on top? No, so, yeah, good point, uh, George. Right. Yeah, good point, George. No, um, so for, for the tsunami analysis, we didn't use the king tide. We used the high tide we used for the tsunami analysis was mean higher high water. Okay. So, so if you had a tsunami at king, that occurred at king tide, it would be even higher than this. Okay. So yeah, we, did, we didn't put that in. So whatever, whatever uh, you know, predicted mean high, high level, right. or mean high, low level, or you know, right. each of these in, in your summary. Yeah. Now that is, a good, that is something we would like input from you guys on. If, um, you know, the, again, going maybe to the probability question you were bringing up, Jim. The, do we want to look at the tsunami occurring with king tide? Um, we, the reason we selected mean higher high was because it looked like the state hazard mapping, most of what we could extract from there is that they were using mean high water to mean higher high water as the tide condition that they used when they did their tsunami modeling. So we, we chose that. 
Okay, so then the results of that analysis in two dimensional now, so mapping it out. Um, so here again, 20, although it's going to label, but 2015, 2030, 2060, and 2100 moving from left to right. And this shows the water surface elevation resulting from that analysis with the tsunami combined with mean high or high water occurring today and with sea level rise in the future. And you can see the flooding all the way to, you know, in 2100, we have flooding topping out now. This is nowhere near the extent of the tsunami flooding I was showing earlier in that other method, okay, um, which of course assumed that we had connection, hydraulic connections, you know, which would be like holes in the, in the sand dunes or storm or uh, pipelines, storm drains, whatever. Um, but this does show that we do get flooding breakout, if you will, in some of the low-lying areas. Um, and I would also point out what this does not include is storm drains themselves. So the storm drains all along the harbor in here with the tsunami coming in or the high tides that could back up the water in there, this does not include that. So this is just water coming over the basically the edges of the channel in the harbor. Okay, so then we did the same thing, but now not with a tsunami, but with the extreme ocean water where we looked at the king tide um, occurring in, in now and in the future with uh, sea level rise. So this one, what you notice is here the same kind of plot starting at the top 2015 to the bottom 2100. You can see that the actual tide level goes up because of sea level rise, but if you look at the results at the boundary condition and the results at point A, they match the same. So, okay. So basically, no no difference there. Um, and here is the result in 2D again. So now we have flooding shown from 2015 up to 2100. Now the surprise here is you have a greater extent of flooding here than you do with the tsunami, okay? And that is attributed to the king tide. That's because of the king tide and the fact that the tide, because it occurs over six hours as opposed to 20 minutes, the tide as it's going up has a lot more time to flow out over the land and cause inundation than the tsunami that occurs at 20 minutes, it goes up, then it comes down. Imagine if you were what we call surface gravity waves, the kind of waves you see at the beach every day. Those are on the range of, say, 10 to 20 seconds. Uh, a lot of those up comes back down, right? So it matters not only how high, but for how long the water level is at that elevation. Okay. okay any questions on that? And again, that's something as you're looking through this, we'd like to get input on um, for how we did that, what, how you think the information could be used, like uh, talking about both of them. Is it clear that we're, the, the method that I presented earlier is different than this method? Okay, that's the kind of thing we'd like to get input from all of you on. Okay, the last one is the storm drain vulnerability mapping. So here, we same kind of approach. We connected a tide condition. We looked at extreme water level again, the king tide with the El Nino from 20, uh, last year. Select the same sea level rise condition. Estimated the maximum water levels for those conditions. We, we, the city, and again, Robert, his folks, getting a storm drain GIS data that had location of all the storm drain out and the invert elevation, which is the elevation of the bottom of the storm drain, and the diameter or height of the storm drain. Okay, so we mapped the outfalls. Now, our great plan when we proposed this was working with Jennifer is I said, oh, why don't we do a red, yellow, green, you know, red light kind of thing, stoplight, right? Red means problem, green means it's okay, yellow is in between. And the way we I came up with that was we thought if the storm drain is here and if the water level is below the, the invert of the storm drain, the invert of the storm drain is high and dry. So we said, you're really not vulnerable. If the water level is somewhere in between, so, you know, it's above the bottom of the storm drain but below the top, it's kind of a moderate, you're yellow. And if it's above the top of the storm drain, then definitely red. And the idea there is it's not, quanti it's not a quantitative thing, it's kind of qualitative, but there still has some sense to it, right? It's 
Because if your pipe is completely underwater, then when the storm's trying to drain flood flows, it's going to have to push really hard against all that water to get out. And consequently, you're going to get back water up, up the pipe. So that was the plan. But when we did the analysis, we got our high water level here. We, we, the average was 7.43, with the highest observed water level at um, the 26th of November. Um, here, we then added the sea level rise, so range from 2015, 7.4 feet up to 12.3 and 2100. Here are the results for the mapping. Okay, this is plan area one. And so the red dots, again, red dots are going to be a problem. The green dots are no problem. And the yellow dots will be moderate, right? So what do you see? It's all red. So um, next one, plan area two. Aha, we had a green. Very excited about that. <coughs> Another one here in plain area three and plain area four. So when I first saw these results, I went back and talked to staff and said, hey, we, you know, where are the green ones? Where are the yellow ones? Uh, there were none. So we, we dug through it again, and I still was concerned. So I contacted, I talked to Chris, and Chris was like, oh, well, yeah, we, we've been had, we had flood problems back in November. He's sending me pictures of all the places where the streets are flooding and everything. So, so I said, oh, so you're not surprised that existing conditions, it looks like a lot of your storm drains are already vulnerable. Yes, it's a problem. So we have uh, anecdotal information <laughs> and, and photographs that show these are already vulnerable under existing sea level. So it just gets worse with sea level rise in the future. And that's it. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. So, David, with those uh, uh, storm drains underwater, um, are you assuming that you have a problem because of the inflow through those drains or a problem if there was uh, rainfall events during that time? If both. If so it's a vulnerability to both. So it could be tidal flooding, like, um, you know, so if the storm drain doesn't have a gate on it, tug gate. So it could be high ocean water is running up the pipe and into the, into the pipe and out the suites if they're low enough. We, we didn't have the, the scope yet to get into the details, but we did do some spot checking at some of the street elevations where some of these come up. And we didn't see, at least under existing sea level, it didn't look like we had a big problem with uh, high tides now backing up into the streets. It was, in the, it, was in the, it was still in the culverts. But then with you had a storm, uh, a rain event, and yeah, then it was bad. So, thank you, David. Sure. Um, coming back to kind of, now that you've seen all this information, I realize it's a lot of information to take in in one, one sitting. Um, and it's all explained in the kind of the technical memorandum that we sent out before the meeting. Um, the goal, is to take what we've done here and now start to use that information to develop our vulnerability assessments, focus in on what each of the planning areas are going to need to do with regards to sea level rise and, as we've seen, existing conditions to start to adapt. Um, but before we take that step, we wanted to run this methodology by this group to make sure that, it, you know, no one sees any fatal flaws in what we've done. Um, that we haven't missed any key facilities that need to be considered or, you know, what, from an emergency perspective or a, a public infrastructure perspective. So we are going to start as we dive into the planning areas to say, all right, we know the wastewater treatment plan is here and under, with this mapping we can see that the wastewater treatment plan is going to be underwater, however much that may be, in 45 years or, or whatever the scenario is under these conditions. Um, we want to make sure we haven't missed any critical pieces of infrastructure. So if you're aware of something like that in a planning area, we, we want that feedback. Um, in addition, you know, David did the storm vulnerability, and we think we have a comprehensive set of all of the storm drains, but if say, the county, in looking at these maps, goes, you know, you actually missed this, this particular piece of infrastructure, we want to know that because we want to integrate that into our mapping and into our our assessment so that we have the full suite of information that we're working with as we move into the more refined work. The, the worst thing that could really happen is that we get down into the end and we start to, you know, really pull this all together and then someone says, hey, you skipped this, this thing here, this large piece here, and we have to take a step back and reassess and, and redo. We want to we wanna avoid that step. So from this group, we really, we're looking for that input and, you know, if you want to go back and 
take the materials and look at them and provide that input over the next few weeks. We're, we're happy to get it if you want to provide it now. We, you know, the stuff we've already gotten, you know, about some of the other sources of information that might be out there that maybe we're not aware of or we haven't run across yet for some of our, our mapping or um, if you have policies that you've seen in other jurisdictions that you think are um, really great and you think they represent best practice and could bring those to our attention. That's the, the goal of this group um, is to really widen our, our area of, you know, widen our pool of expertise that we're pulling from and also to run past you some of our, our technical work before we present it to the public because what we, we want to avoid is presenting results to the public or policies to the public that then we we pull back from and, you know, if they get attached to something and all of a sudden it's dropped out, they're going to want to, they're going to want to know why. So um, we really want this technical group of experts to really help us um, move forward uh, based on what we've done so far. Um, one thing I forgot. Um, might have meant on the tsunami analysis, we didn't analyze that, that analysis I just showed at the, um, not the end, the middle analysis, the hydrodynamic model. We didn't model the Goleta 2 landslide tsunami, which was a larger tsunami. And the reason is we didn't have the measured data for that. And what we found in the literature, there was no information on exactly what the water level was, what the period of that tsunami was. So we really didn't have the raw material we needed to run the model for that. So one of the things we'd like input on is, is that something that needs to be done too? Um, are we okay with going with this? with this event, just the Japanese one, because if not, then this is one of the things that we would need to figure out a new approach as to how we could do that kind of modeling with a tsunami generated by the Galita 2 landslide. Or if there's a, an alternate tsunami scenario that is larger than the one we think we need mm -hmm. to add that in, yeah. that's the kind of input that we, we're looking for. You know, I, I thought one interesting point was, um, was about probability, and I know that the comment earlier is not really bringing in the probability in here, so I, I think that would be of interest. Uh, um, so I'm not sure if that gets, that's not part of the fundamental analysis, uh, or it will be discussed by comment. And then um, I think the other part was um, the topography. You have, you have, you have the erosion, due to erosion as part of the overall modeling. And, and I don't know how elevation is clearly um, you know, part of the data input uh, to find key changes. That, um, you have you know, some levels of natural barrier, natural data that's been around. I'm mm -hmm. not sure how that figures in. I think that's one of the data inputs, one of the scenarios that you, you include uh, in looking at combined effects. Uh, but you know, those are the two areas that are just uh, pretty watchful. Great, thank you. Does anybody have anything else they want to add at this time? I mean, thanks so much for the comments we got already. Um, are there any questions? Uh, the next steps really are that we'll take any inputs we get, we're going to refine our analysis, start to work through the vulnerability assessments, and then we'd like to reconvene this group and we have some more specifics for each of the areas, um, some of the economics and some of the draft policies. Uh, and to get some input on that, but sorry, question. Yeah, I, I'm just kind of thinking in terms of how best to present this sort of information to the public. And you know, the public, I think, is used to thinking about flood maps with a hundred-year flood or mm -hmm. five hundred-year flood. You can kind of come to grips with that. Here we have a number of projected threats, of probability, and how it seems like. We need to synthesize those, maybe prioritize the, the threats. I mean, some threats may not have much significance either because they vary with very low probability or very low, uh, relatively low amplitude. Uh, whereas others, it you know, takes much more prominence. So I, I don't have an answer there, but it seems like that. Kind of not that you have to right. work on. We've been dealing with that night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is how it came up with this, but you know, that's a, that's a good point. We yeah. have to think about how to present that in a way. That's why we did we did separate the tsunami from that, because again it was did you add you could 
have a tsunami on top of the combined air, um, you know, in theory it could happen, right? You could have yeah. all of this together. But, but you know, like the probability of a tsunami occurring simultaneously when it came to ice. This is pretty low, but pretty low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I probably could put a, a number on it, perhaps. Yeah. I'm not sure. We've gotten, like, what about the probability of a, a large coastal storm occurring with a king tide or even a higher, uh, a spring higher high tide? So even within my office, we debate that because it's like, well, according to FEMA regs, they would, they would do something lower. They'd say mean high water. I said, yeah, but most storms in California are in the hours of duration, right? Several hours. And so it's equally probable, I think, that the storm could occur on a day that's a spring tide versus a non-spring tide. And if that storm lasts several hours, it's going to hit the high tide, the spring high water. So it seems like that one made sense to, con to consider that. The king tide is more like, you know, two or three times a year. So maybe that's a bit much, but... Or, or just say to the 1983 El Nino uh, season, we had a series of storms that came every maybe every week or every several days, and, and that kind of wore the dunes down, if you will. So right. yeah, more than just a single storm, that's a series. That whole season, yeah, it's very energetic, and it makes it complicated. I think the public, uh, you know, they, they, they uh, you don't have to be trained as to uh, statistics, but you know, that uh, in complicated statistics or complicated types of models. But I think that just understand probability and statistics and it, and it explaining that, that model or a return period. That that's a term as well, but mm -hmm. but I think they, they can understand you know certainly different things have different return periods and how yeah. that propagates up. I think they'd they'd be able to understand that. Yeah, and I think uh, Dr. Lynn, so you think that uh, from your perspective on the well, your, the constituents do you think they don't understand? We, we're all familiar. I was going to bring this up anyway. You know, we we we're all used to a disaster like the '82, '83, you know, motivating everyone to, to do something finally because there's real damage and real harm. And then, as we were talking about earlier, for the next 10 or 20 years interest is go somewhere else. There's nothing happened. Nothing yeah. happened. And, so, okay. and then that same disaster comes back and we think they're like, oh, we should have, but we didn't, and now let's do it. And then it goes away. So how, here's my question for emergency services. Um, you know, so we're planning for EOC type activations for recurring storms, and we know they're going to come. At what point do we quit calling them emergencies? And this is just the weather. You know, this is just normal things now. And same with high tides inundating uh, uh, local flooding in like Newport Harbor, help me out, Coastal Commission, where every month they're getting flooded. It's no longer just an emergency, it's just, it's just the new normal. And one of our decisions we got to make in terms of policies is what do we call an emergency and treat one way, and what do we call the, the current or future normal for which we should have regular facilities to handle. So that's kind of a gray area. Well, that, that's where you have to bring in the, the impact. The yeah, yeah. And so what's the vulnerability? You know, what's the money? As the person mentioned, yeah. you know, critical public services, yeah. Yeah. hospitals, police. So we use a higher standard for right. critical facilities. Maybe we use another standard for golf courses and stuff like that. And uh, the, gu the guidance from the Coastal Commission is kind of gives us direction on that. It's quite scary. They're telling us to use the highest worst case for critical facilities. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, yeah the, considering the, the sensitivity and adaptive capacity of the asset you're talking about. Or, and, and I guess the consideration there is if that facility is temporarily knocked out, can the modeling give us enough information to know that blue color on the map is six inches deep or four feet deep. You know, we, we can't tell. Is it moving water? Is it standing still? Is it really doing anything bad? How long is it there? And if this facility goes out, is there a backup? Is there, you know, is, is, if it goes offline for three hours, that's not a problem. If it's offline for a week, that's a different thing. And it costs a god of money to fix. So these are things we're, we're headed that way. We don't know how well we can we'll, we'll try. Right, that's what we're moving towards. You know, from, from the emergency services.
perspective, if, if you want to boil it down to the simplest common denominator, failure to plan on your part is not an emergency on my part. <laughs> but keeping this in mind when we're trying to make this palatable to yeah. the public, they really don't care about 2030, 2060, 2100. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? When is it going to happen? How often is it going to happen? Because that is the information that they want when you come to them and say, I need tax money to fix this problem. If we don't solve, if we don't answer those very simple questions, all of this is moot. Nothing's going to happen between now and 2100. We need to break this down to the most simple terms that the people who are paying us to do this can understand the reason why we need to do it. We're writing down what's going to happen. When it's going to happen, how often is it going to happen, and how much is it going to cost me? The four big questions. Yeah. <coughs> uh, in my view, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. The one thing I was going to say is uh, we have to be able to speak a language that other people also understand. I mean, we're talking about public policy department and Oxford with a lot of different uh, pl plans for building things. People who build things do not build them for 100 years. They don't build a treatment plant for 100 years. They're looking 30 years maybe, you know, 40 years. So I think we want to, what we want to be thinking about is we want to get to a point where we speak kind of the same language and we come and say, okay, this is a huge threat. It has to be done within the next so many years. And we want to start thinking about after that what we might be doing as the pair of the sea level rise keeps coming up and all the things. So I think we want to find a way to kind of speak the same language, at least with the people who are in the technical field. Now, the public is a whole different story. Right. It's a self -point. And luckily, we have all that farmland we can use. Oh, sorry, we're in county. <laughs> <laughs> so you're kind of suggesting that maybe in terms of public policy, you have a policy that evolves. That's right. Yeah, you have yeah. one that's that, right. that applies today Absolutely. and that applies Absolutely. And, and that's the, the orientation we're taking. Yeah. Uh, the, the further out we go, the more vague, I guess. Well, well uh, I'm vague yeah. on the right word, but more adaptable or right. evolving. Right. Yeah. Well, you can be vague, but, but you can be pretty assured that levels are going to be going up. Yeah. I guess down. What, what we're trying to not do is put in very specific things right. that the city has to do right now based on right. the very long term yeah. scenario because as the science evolves, as the information evolves, we don't want to, and, and knowing that this LTP will be updated between now and 2100, maybe, <laughs> um, we don't want the city to start spending money now on things that are to react to something that could happen 85 years from now. We want to have more specifics in the near term, planning and understanding and taking account of the long term, but knowing that this may change Think, you know, it may get worse, it may get better, uh, it may play out in a different way than the current modeling shows. Um, but as I said before, it's all information. It's information we intend to use and to inform what we're doing. Um, and information is always good. So any additional information is welcome. Um, knowing that how we present this to the public is going to be key. They have already seen these maps. Um, and they're available on the TNC website as well. Um, they're really here repackaged for the city. Um, but you're right, how we present this to the public, and so the, the intent would be to focus in on the near term for the public and what we can do now in response to things, and then as we move forward, you know, have them understand that this is it's information, we're, we're using this information, but it's not, this isn't absolutely what's going to happen. And to add to that, to address one of your points about the design life, for example, project life, um, again, the, the Coastal Commission guidance, the policy guidance, does split it in two, right? They have the guidance for sea level rise for LCP work, which we're doing now, and then there's the CDP on what you would do for a CDP if you're actually applying for a permit for a project. And they have different approaches for how you would handle those. Um, 
And so, to your point on, like, if you were getting a CDP, you were going to design a, a new building. It, it does take into consideration what the what project is, what the project life. Um, but there are some cases that I've worked on two railroad designs um, for, did some hydraulic studies for railroad designs down in San Diego County. And initially, the first thought was the railroad in San Diego was like, well, you know, we don't have to worry about this. It's not that big a deal. They come back and they say, so the initial thought was, we don't have to address the LRI, so, you know, we're just going to put the bridge in now. And it took probably in the last 34 years. I said, well, how long has the existing bridge been there? <laughs> <laughs> 1885. <laughs> Hard to make that argument. Yeah, so yeah, so they, they've taken that into consideration. Think, okay, maybe we do need to consider a little longer term. How long are we going to build this bridge? But they built an adaptation measure to say, how about if we design it for somewhere in between? Now we don't go all the way up to 2100. But what if we design the foundation so that and the bridge structure to allow easy manipulation in, say, 30, 40 years that we could raise it? That's what right. do. And that's what they've done. That's one measure that they use. And those are the types of things we're going to be considering as we develop, you know, looking out into the future horizon. Is there any, I, I realize we're over time, but. Just real quick, as far as the current conditions go, like in the Oxnard Shores area, I have a database 